My name is Alan Lynch. I teach in what amounts to the political science department here at the University of Virginia. This is the panel on social action in regional cultures, the caucuses. Uh, before I introduce our panelists, I have a little personal anecdote that basically reinforces the wonderful lecture that we just heard. In 1992, I was administering the Harriman Institute at Columbia University, and then I received an offer from the University of Virginia that I really couldn't refuse, so I moved from Columbia University in New York City to Charlottesville in University of Virginia, and when my Russian friends found out, they basically held the equivalent of an Irish wake for Alan because they wanted to know, oh my God, what happened to him, right? So basically projecting their concepts of center and periphery onto American context, so in any event. Um, I'm delighted to introduce our panelists. I'll introduce them at the beginning and then their titles as they begin their talks. Each will speak for about 20 minutes and then we'll have about an hour for discussion. We'll probably close around 4.30. There is free time after that till dinner, so uh, we have a little bit of flexibility in that regard. Uh, in the middle is Urban Yaksha, who is uh, currently a doctoral candidate at the University of York. His research focuses on critical geopolitics within Eastern Europe, in particular the politics of what he calls writing space, that is relations amongst practices of memory, remembering and forgetting, representation, redrawing maps, renaming places, and communication, propaganda, information war, and such. On my immediate right is Mohammed Gizbulayev, a junior research fellow in the Department of Ancient and Medieval History of Dagestan, at the Institute of History, Archaeology, and Ethnography in the Dagestani branch of the Russian Academy of Sciences. His research interests are related to the issues of the history of Islamic intellectual culture of the Caucasus, focusing on Dagestan, Russian-Dagestani relations after the Great Caucasian War, and international relations more generally. So with those introductions, I'll turn the floor over to Orban Yashka, who will be talking about citizens' attitudes toward Grozny's reconstruction and its effects on identity. So Urban Yashka has the floor. Okay, thank you. Um, so I'll be talking about um, citizens' uh, attitudes to Grozny's reconstruction and some of the identity issues um, associated with it. I'll make a short introduction, then I'll, I'll say a few words about the religious and national identity in Chechnya. Um, I'll, I'll follow up with um, Grozny's uh, reconstruction and transformation and make a brief um, conclusion. Now, between 2003 and 2009, uh, Grozny was transformed from a pile of ruins to a city of skyscrapers. Brand new apartment buildings topped with a huge mosque, um, luxurious hotel and extensive parks in the center. Ramzan Kadyrov, the Moscow-backed strongman and president of Chechnya, who oversaw the construction, was praised um, by people from Grozny to Moscow and even the UN, who praised the city administration for providing thousands of new homes. The capital of the Republic of um, this, um, this Republic, which lies on Russia's southern periphery, seemed to have risen from the ashes of war with lightning speed. But doubts soon spread um, regarding the project, with reports of alleged corruption, lack of transparency, and low quality of corruption. Um, in this fire, um, much of uh, this apartment uh, building uh, burned down because of, uh, of low quality of materials used uh, in the facade. Um, so is Grozny a beautiful phoenix or a Potemkin village of false appearances? Did reconstruction and transformation meet people's expectations or serve as a prestige project for its leaders? In my paper, I look at how post-war reconstruction projects begun in Chechnya and in Grozny specifically have tried to reconcile different identities, what kind of territorial practices and symbolic power the Kadiro regime exercised um, through reconstruction and how this resonated with the inhabitants of Grozny. 
Um, my paper is based on secondary literature, but also two visits um, to Chechnya in November and December of 2014, during which I conducted a series of uh, semi-structured interviews with um, 11 inhabitants of Grozny. Um, and these are not meant to be representative of, of uh, the, the population of Grozny as a whole, but it's just to add uh, another layer of understanding of the message conveyed by the reconstruction program. Um, another layer is added by the, the visual material, the photographs, uh, of which most of, of them are my own, and the, the ones I used uh, that are not my own are, are referenced. Um, starting with the identity, Chechens remain, remain sort of the other uh, to this day. Um, and this is sort of this romantic representation of um, Circassians in this case, but also um, of North, uh, North Caucasians in general as sort of noble savages and um, primitive, warlike, but also honorable and uh, living in harmony. Uh, with nature, the sort of um, image of a lone jigit abrek um, brave brave warrior uh, that remains to this day, and Chechnya is um, the most autonomous of Russia's republics, um, which can be observed on the constitutional level, from uh, including elements of Sharia law regulating everything from con uh, alcohol consumption to to dressing. Um, on the military level, Kadyrov disposes of his own uh, military units, um, as well as on the everyday, everyday level, traditions and practices. Um, now, I don't have the, the time here to describe Chechen traditions and, and social norms, rules, um, sort of adat, the tape system, and so on, uh, in detail. Um, but I do want to say a few words about um, religious and um, national identity, which are um, sort of crucial in this post-Soviet transformation. In Chechen history, religious identity was built as much endogenously as it was exogenously, in opposition to various conquerors. Islam came to Chechnya fairly late in the 16th century, with conversions taking place um, until the 19th century. Um, Islam in Chechnya was an instrumental in mobilizing resistance to Russian rule, as Russian rule was for consolidating uh, Islam. And the personality of Sheikh Mansour, who in the second half of the 18th century rallied Chechens in resistance to Catherine the Great's imperial incursions into the Caucasus, um, best illustrates this fact. Sheikh Mansour, who was an imam in a still largely pagan country at the time, um, framed resistance to Russian expansionism as a holy war. He wanted Sharia to replace the old tradition of Adat, uh, the customary law, and paganism, as well as the newly introduced habits such as smoking tobacco. Um, this declaration of holy war was subsequently further defined and referred to as Gazavat, um, defensive, defensive jihad with Caucasian characteristics by Imam Shamil, but also by Chechen Islamists during um, the Chechen wars. In late 1980s and 1990s, a generational gap emerged as a result of radicalization of the younger part of Chechen society, while the older population mostly kept to their Sufi, predominantly Qadiri and Naqshbandi traditions. Um, different factors caused this transformation from endogenous, the collapse of communism, Soviet Union and the value crisis, to exogenous um, Russian invasion and the presence of Mujahideen um, on Chechen soil. Now, national identity, based on common language and traditions, was shaped by inter-ethnic conflict with Russians and began to emerge as distinct from religious identity quite late, crystallizing in the second half of the 1980s during the period of Glasnost and Perestroika while several Soviet nationalities also experienced their identity revival. Um, greater openness permitted voicing grievances of Chechens who were economically marginalized, and it also permitted a more open discussion about historical persecution and um, the deportation of 1944. Um, just a second. Okay, so 
when I asked people about, um, about their identity, uh, most of my interviewees agreed that religious and national identity somewhat converge, or in the words of one of the respondents, I quote, to be Chechen is to be Muslim, unquote. However, if ethnic and religious identities coincide, that doesn't mean that the political ideologies based on them also do. During the de facto independence of Chechen Republic of Ichkeria, as it was known at the time, a split emerged between nationalists and Islamists. Nationalists who came mostly from the military camp, like Presidents Dudayev and Aslan Mashkadov, uh, were both Soviet officers and were in favor of a secular republic. Whereas Presidents uh, Yandarbiev and Sadulayev, who were a writer and an imam respectively, wanted the creation of an Islamic state. During the period of de facto independence of Chechnya, um, it became a sort of a black hole, a zone of illegality and organized crime run by warlords and riddled, riddled with infighting and corruption. Islamists promised to bring security to the local population and to eradicate corruption and tackle crime through implementation of Sharia. Um, similarly to, to the Taliban in Afghanistan or the, the Islamic Courts Union in in Somalia and so on. Um, the Islamists, however, became progressively more radical to the point of dropping the goal of implementing Sharia uh, in Chechnya for an ideal of creating a wider Caucasus Emirate. Um, this is the idea that, for instance, Shamil Basayev and Doka Omaro um, subscribed to. Um, and the 99 uh, invasion of Dagestan by the Chechnya-based Islamic International Brigade was an attempt to put this idea in practice. Uh, a plan that badly misfired, triggering the Second Chechen War and annexation and reincorporation into the Russian Federation. Now, I'm going to talk a bit more about Grozny's reconstruction. Uh, it's worth noting here and making the explicit connection with the theme of the conference that nationalism and Islamism are the two main centrifugal forces in Chechnya and the current political regime of Ramzan, Ramzan Kadyrov, um, who succeeded his, his father, Ahmad Kadyrov, has tried to reconcile both, um, promoting a non-confrontational form of Chechen nationalism, tradition, uh, traditional moderate Islam, and unity with Russia. I argue that the post-war reconstruction of Grozny and other cities in Chechnya reflects this attempt at, at reconciliation and transformation. Now, in 2003, two years after the end of the Second Chechen War, um, Grozny was called the world's most destroyed city. As a result of two devastating wars, few buildings remained standing. However, soon after a reconstruction program was begun, infrastructure was repaired and thousands of new apartment buildings, um, apartments were built. President Ramzan Kadyrov oversaw the construction of the biggest mosque in Europe and the Grozny city towers, a set of skyscrapers housing luxurious apartments and a five-star hotel. That was the, the image I showed before well, with the burn, one of them burning. Um, the main drag um, south of Grozny city became Kadyrov Avenue, named after the father of the incumbent president. And upon crossing the Sunja River, the name of the street changes to Putin Avenue, named after the Russian president who played, interestingly enough, a crucial role in the Second Chechen War and in the crushing of the separatist uh, Chechen Republic of Ichkeria. Ahmad Kadyrov um, and Ramzan Kadyrov have tried to navigate between local and global between commitment to tradition and the acceptance of foreign influence through globalization. And I argue that four, four inspirations and four, or four influences can be observed in the reconstruction of Grozny. The first one is commitment to Chechen traditions. Um, in this case, the megalomaniac project uh, called Grozny City II um, that will have the Ahmad Tower, um, an 80-story 400 meter tower, um, which is more than twice the height of uh, Space Needle in Seattle. Um, of course, drawing on, on the Chechen traditions, uh, traditional architecture of guard towers. Um, we have 
the Russian and Soviet influences in infrastructure, urbanism, apartment buildings. Um, then we have that, what I call um, Western globalization. So this is one of the malls in, uh, in Grozny. Um, and these are, these are various kinds of, of Western influences from, from posters of Ramzan Kadyrov po posing with his role model Mike Tyson um, to various kinds of copies of, of Western brands from McDowell's to Nike and to different kinds of Apple shops. And just in case, if, if you don't know if you want to get an iPhone or an Android phone, Grozny's shops have an answer to this. So you can get an Apple Droid. Um, so there's a lot of sort of um, mixing of these traditions. Um, some of them, of course, propagated by the government, others spontaneously adopted. We also have the fourth uh, influence, which I call the non-Western globalization, um, which is predominantly reflected in the architecture of mosques. This is the main mosque um, uh, in the name of uh, Ahmad Kadyrov in, in Grozny, which is basically a copy of um, the, the Blue Mosque in, in Istanbul, except that it's bigger because it, it has to be, right? It has to be the biggest mosque in Europe. And, of course, also the, the influences from uh, more Arab world, the, the Gulf, so is Islamic fashion. And um, today Grozny is a strange and, and confusing to foreigners, and, and that includes Russians as well. Um, and the glitter of the main streets gives way to, um, to, to dirt roads like this. Um, Soviet-style piping just a few, few black blocks away from the main avenues. Um, and, oh, I didn't show you this, this photo. Um, so this is from the reception of um, the Grozny City Hotel. So you have this clocks, um, the time of, of Moscow, which symbolizes the, the political center to which Grozny gravitates. Um, the time in Mecca, which is the religious center to which it gravitates. And Tokyo, I can't quite explain this, but I guess they wanted to show that you know they're cosmopolitan, but you can't quite put New York or Washington there. It would, would be probably too too contentious. So um, these projects are important for the regime from the point of view of prestige and identity building, um, but are essentially part of a Potemkin village, which hides the fact that Chechnya is one of the poorest administrative units in Russia and heavily dependent on the federal budget. Those inhabitants of Grozny, which I interviewed without getting to know them better before the interview, seem to speak of the reconstruction in more positive terms than those I knew from before. This was probably due to the latter being more comfortable speaking about politically controversial issues. Some citizens talked about the reconstruction of Grozny with pride. They saw the new Grozny as beautiful and the reconstruction process as fast. They praised the president and attributed the success of the process to him. Indeed, there are banners in Grozny, which in the name of the citizens of Grozny, praise the president for building tall apartment buildings, beautiful resting places, wonderful mosques and cities. Never mind that these banners were put up by local authorities politically affiliated with Ramzan Kadyrov rather than by the citizens or on their initiative. And Chechnya has since the collapse of the USSR exhibited the strongest centrifugal forces, showing the most desire for independence of any federal um, subject of the Russian Federation, fighting two bitter wars with Russia and experiencing a short-lived, unrecognized statehood between them. This desire hasn't vanished with the end of Second Chechen War, coming into power of the Kadyrovs or the marginalization of insurgency, as, as pointed out by some interviewees. The inter-ethnic conflict and grievances run deep, and as one, interview said, one interviewee said, I quote, each family lost someone, each family suffered. We can never forgive the Russians for what they have done, unquote. So many Chechens still hope to achieve independence one day, 
but this hope remains silent as the authoritarian political regime doesn't permit open expression of separatist views or for that matter any, any dissenting views. And as a result, many have become apathetic or, or cynical, seeing no hope that the situation could improve in the near future. Grozny, which has seen some of the fiercest urban warfare since the end of Cold War, is despite sporadic terrorist attacks relatively safe. And this is actually the scene of the last terrorist attack, um, which happened in December 4th, I think, 2014. I was there five days after, after it happened. And um, the city authorities were still making, um, making very strong efforts to try to erase, uh, to try to rebuild this very fast. They were working around the clock, 24 hours a day. Um, to basically erase all traces of, of physical violence and instability and to try to reassure the population and, and everyone else that they're in control of the situation. Um, so, so it basically is a pretty safe, a pretty safe place um, with, with sporadic attacks still happening. However, that doesn't mean that there is no, um, no conflict. Um, despite both official Moscow and Grozny, um, as well as the UN, as we've uh, heard previously, praising the reconstruction. Interviews show that um, it remains a controversial project. Indeed, the conflict seems to continue on the identity and discursive levels, with the republic and municipal authorities rewriting history through rewriting space. How else can we, um, we understand the naming of the main avenue in Grozny after Vladimir Putin than as simply a provocation and, and symbolic violence. Um, while names of yesterday's heroes of Chechnya, like Dudayev and Mashkadov, have been erased from history, the name of today's self-styled heroes, Ahmad and Ramzan Kadyrov, adorns every important building in the city, be it mosque, library, museum, business center, stadium, boxing center, or apartment building. As we see, this is the portrait of, of the previous uh, president, Ahmad Kadyrov, on horseback. Perhaps one of the crucial elements in the transformation of Grozny, Chechnya and the Chechen national identity, has been trying to reject the image of Grozny and Chechnya as part of periphery. The Chechen leadership has exhibited an almost ridiculous degree of ego egocentrism, and if Moscow may be the center of the Russian Federation, um, according to this monument, Grozny Center Mira, Grozny is the center of the world. I thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Urban Yashka. We now turn to Mohammed Gizbulaev, who will be addressing the theme violence and identity crisis in Dagestan. First of all, I would like to uh, express my gratitude to the organizers of this conference and for having me. Uh, the topic, as you can see, is a violence and identity crisis in Dagestan. The intent of my paper is to, to provide a better understanding of the instability in Dagestan in the recent history. And I would like to show um, to the main factors or causes of this instability. And most of the people of Dagestan uh, associate themselves with uh, Russia and are proud of being of its citizens. But their ex uh, experiences are replete with uh, tales of denial and exclusion and uh, discrimination of some groups on the one hand and excess exclusion, inclusion and a sense of belonging by other groups on the other. Uh, uh, the notions of othering and being othered are crucial in identity politics. Mm. This uh, concept, uh, the, the concept identity politics is used here to denote the process of categorizing people into groups uh, more often based on assumptions and stereotypes. There is thus uh, mm, a 
I mean, it's, uh, there is thus a regular sense of in their character, or uh, in the more popular Russian terms, natsmen, chorny, wahhabist, alitso kavkaske nationality. These terms are commonly used in Russia to refer to um, members of the predominantly Muslim nationality of the North Caucasus. Such categorization becomes the basis for a range uh, of issues related to rights and opportunities. Uh, the issue becomes more critical because identity is a form in which uh, the citizenship question is posed and practically experienced, uh, especially in relation to material uh, issues. As spelled out in both in Russian and Dagestani uh, constitutions, um, rights and privileges is in a comprehensive uh, manner as to ensure rights of all citizens. Uh, the issue is not, however, the constitution, but the application of its provisions to reality. Uh, this position is uh, explicitly expressed by the um, Alexander Bastrykin, head of the Russian investigative committee, who suggests uh, taking dactyloscopia and DNA samples from uh, people who originally come from the North Caucasus. Uh, moreover, uh, Vladimir Zhirinovsky, uh, who opened the internal migration of the inhabitants of the, the North Caucasus uh, and proposed to limit the birth rate of Caucasians as well as to uh, protect the territory of the Caucasus uh, barbed by. Um, uh, there are, uh, so there also there is uh, girls' rights for education is uh, exclusively to uh, the to public school girls uh, with secular mode of life, uh, girls wearing hijab are required to go away. Uh, in April 2013, all school girls were expelled after wearing a Muslim headscarf uh, from uh, three public schools in Bunax, in Dagestan. Um, some of these forms of discrimination have been even uh, formalized through a law officially prohibiting Wahhabism in Dagestan. Mm, and hundreds of Salafis uh, were arrested since 1919. Uh, within the framework of uh, con conducting a, a battle uh, and with extremism and terrorism, the federal and local authorities have placed a serious um, uh, serious uh, limits on many Muslim institutions. The, this practice led to a determination, deterioration of the f uh, financial situation of Muslim societies and, and ended many mu business and educational programs. The, The denials of rights and opportunities on the basis of identity have resulted in many cases of violence in Dagestan. Uh, this uh, uh, was particularly true each time a rayon or district and rural localities um, creation uh, exercises were carried out. Here are some uh, uh, examples uh, uh, illustrated. Um, a, a residential suburb of Mahachkala uh, Novostroy, uh, where the resettled Lux as a minority are the majority. Uh, the same is true of the Chechen's Akins uh, in Novolaksky district, not yet Aukhovsky. Um, the Avars in the villages uh, Lenaul and Kalinaul in Kazbekovsky district. A few national majorities find themselves as ethnic minorities, such as the Avars in Bayurtovsky district and the Kumiks in Leningrad. Thus, whenever a new district is created, uh, some who were uh, hitherto indigenous of the pro previous district, uh, district uh, cease to enjoy that status. Hmm. So, uh, and uh, I would like to quote uh, Yarlikapov, 
who is ex an expert in these uh, issues, particularly related to the inter-ethnic uh, conflicts uh, based on land. Uh, the, the organ, uh, the Dagestan is uh, getting over the consequences of organized resettlement of Highlanders that uh, to flight plans began in the Soviet era and various violations connected to them. The main question uh, for the conflict is land and since the settlers come from different um, ethnicities, these, uh, these, these conflicts have an inter-ethnic uh, inter char uh, character. In, in Dagestan, uh, ethnic identity is one of the mobilizing uh, factors. Uh, however, none of these conflicts based on land dispute were open. And because Dagestan society is intricate, uh, is because of the intricate um, ethnic structure has inhibited the conflicting elements from taking from, uh, taking from from taking radical steps. More terrible are conflicts over denial and exclusion of a huge number of the citizens from rights and opportunities enjoyed by others. It is important to focus on uh, Salafism in Dagestan. They are one of the greatest challenges of the, uh, of, uh, the, 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 of the Dagestan people is the issues of identity conflict, both uh, Muslim and secular visions. Uh, there are conscious efforts to reclaim the space and in some sense uh, emancipate themselves from uh, perceived Orthodox Russian and secular values stranglehold. To illustrate the emergence of Muslim radio channel, Vatan and TV programs, charitable foundations, in San, Nadezhda, private nursery and secondary uh, schools, uh, Zemfira, Amina, Nova Epakalenia, and halal restaurants. Also the names of several streets, for example in Mahachkala, such as Kalinina, Lenina, Marksa, Karla Marksa, and Dvatshes Bakins Kamisarov, uh, I mean, uh, who uh, perceived to be imposed by the uh, Soviets, uh, have now been uh, changed uh, to Imama Shamila, Rasula Gamzatova, Aligaja Kushinskova, and Magam Yarakskova. Uh, uh, so, so some uh, studies have indicated that Dagestani society is moving toward greater reliance on traditional norms, both Islamic and cultural. Historically, Dagestan's uh, Islamic st identity uh, has interplayed and competed with the ethnic ones. There is some peculiarity in this uh, to the Dagestan composition, in the, uh, which shows an old Russian identity is stronger among the uh, older generation, uh, while a controversial uh, mix of old Russian and Muslim Caucasian identity uh, is prevalent among the uh, young generation. In this context, uh, the authorities' actions often uh, draw uh, of, uh, of the, um, draw the uh, irritation of the Muslims who are loyal to the Russian state but are critical of uh, the methods it uses against the Salafi groups, ranging from the censorship of religious materials, surveillance, assassination, and arrests. So uh, the, these uh, are the main uh, groups, I mean, identity groups. I mean, the identity conflict has div uh, divided the Dagestan people into these main groups. Uh, uh, virtually all, the first two are uh, official, I mean, uh, were promoted by the Russian official uh, propaganda as an alienate view of Islam, and that is uh, that divided Islam into not traditional, that is aggressive, politicized, and occasionally used in the extremist movements, uh, Salafism or fundamentalism, and traditional. Uh, which was related to the uh, mystic uh, teachings and seen as independent from scholarly Islam, Sufism. And the th third, Dagestan also has a large secular community. It identifies with uh, no Islamic value systems. So within this uh, uh, context, Dagestan value system developed into two directions. One is uh, uh, within the general context of the Russian space, broadly pro-Russian in its orientation, and the second, uh, both, I mean, second trend seeking both Islamic modernity and uh, liberation from the Russian yoke. Uh, 
since uh, the beginning of the 2000s, some several thousand Dagestani Sufis or Salafi Muslims minister, uh, ministers and uh, members of uh, local security forces, politicians and journalists have been killed by suspected armed, and armed underground members or local federal uh, security forces. Uh, in this, uh, for example, I use uh, this uh, diagram to uh, illustrate the, the scale of the, this uh, uh, of identity crisis-based violence. Uh, over the past five years, 2010 and 14, uh, the total number of uh, uh, the total number of killed were, uh, was uh, more than um, 1,500. As you can see, the uh, number of civilians and uh, power agents uh, is steadily declining year after year. Uh, as, uh, however, the number of uh, militants uh, hasn't uh, was not uh, seen. Uh, I mean, wasn't there wasn't an essential changes in. So this uh, still uh, uh, illustrates that how um, how is the situation? How how gross is the situation in, in Dagestan? Uh, next uh, diagram shows uh, um, that um, uh, over seven hundred uh, over seven hundred violent incidents within uh, January two thousand and uh, March. Uh, 2010 w were marked uh, with, the, with uh, 322 recorded in 2009. Mm. These uh, incidents illustrate how identity is used uh, as the basis to access opportunities and ultimately inclusive uh, citizenship. Uh, Moscow uh, is continuing the policy of the Soviet Union aimed at reinforcing the divisions among uh, existing um, divisions existing in Dagestan, especially ethnic and religious division, divisions. And moreover, it has facilitated the continued exclusion of those uh, of those on the fringes of society who now express their dissatisfaction through violence. Mm -hmm. This is uh, in, this, in some apparent display of uh, as Goretsky has referred to as a full-fledged civil war. So uh, now I would like to shift to the next uh, the next uh, section is the implication of identity-based violence. Uh, the key challenges I would like to list the key challenges um, thrown up by the spate of identity-based violence uh, in a situation where the uh, shadow economy is uh, more than 50% and there is an, uh, no security of lives and property. Economic activity is a prime uh, causality. Uh, this is even more profound in relation to domestic and foreign investment which are regularly courted by the Republican government. Uh, there is now a de facto, uh, a de facto split of Dagestan uh, Dagestan's society into three main groups. Um, the first one, numerous, is the Sufis. It here uh, is supported of the uh, supportive of the authorities. The second one is uh, uh, is uh, smaller but active. Salafis is persecuted by the authorities. In general, both of these groups support Dagestan Islamization. For example, they call on believers to not to celebrate New Year and the International Women's uh, Day, March 8. The third group, which continues to stand up for the secular state. Uh, believing that Islamization reverses modern trends and takes Dagestan farther away from Russia. Uh, conclusions. Uh, so I would like to uh, to conclude my paper. Um, uh, it is important to uh, remember that the uh, problem uh, is not uh, the diversity per se, but the, its uh, management. Uh, 
the contrast between the, the, contrast between the high mainstream uh, culture and the original Islamic culture of the Dagestanis often um, results in an inferiority, uh, in, in inferiority complex, which is uh, an additional factor of, for their alienation from um, the political and social environment. Uh, the federal and local governments should reduce the uh, tensions between diverse uh, groups in Dagestan by um, ensuring equal access to employment, uh, seeking mutually acceptable solutions to land disputes, starting with the less challenging conflicts, uh, developing civic national identity, and seizing, uh, seizing repression of Muslims. Uh, almost two decades of abusive behavior by law enforcement personnel uh, have eroded citizens' belief in the rule of uh, law. Thank you. Um, you know, please, uh, uh, UVA. Uh, just for um, Magomed, uh, a couple, just a couple of just in, informational questions. Um, what do you mean by a power agent? And why was 2009 so bad for um, violent incidents? Um, and then what is the basis of the shadow economy? What's being either traded or manufactured or whatever? Well, could you clarify the last point? Um, you said the shadow economy was about 50% ah, of the yeah. Dagestani. So power agent 2009 and Friend, uh, First the of shadow all, I would economy. like to uh, thank you very much. Um, the power agents, uh, I, uh, it means uh, uh, Law enforcement uh, personnel, power agents, special forces, or you call it. And uh, the second one, why it is uh, 2009 is marked as with a high level of incidents, uh, because of the uh, one of the reasons is, uh, uh, in my view, is the competition between uh, local elites for the uh, resources. Power resource, economics, and other resources. No, because you see, you see that uh, that period was, uh, you know, prior to that, in 2006, uh, the, uh, the president of uh, Dagestan was Mukho Aliyev. He is an Avar. And prior to that, what 15 years, uh, for almost 15 years, uh, was a representative of the Dargins. So they were very much dissatisfied by losing that uh, position. So they did all uh, to uh, sabotage, uh, sabotage what they are there, that he is unable to control the situation. You see all the bombings and something like that. This is uh, my view. What's the shadow economy shadow based on? economy, yeah, it is that uh, they are not, to uh, nalogum. No, no, I know what Specifically. Ah. Uh, manufacturing, yeah, all this, be a Sredni, Malib Sredni business. But, um, Not premium. No, not uh, closest we uh, it uh, close uh, but it may be a uh, uh, product uh, product it may be and uh, uh, this um, uh, business related to the um, uh, restaurants and something like this services Sur service sector yes okay uh, uh, professor Urbanovich you Salary is paid, I mean, in envelopes. This is, I mean, but this is, I mean, what is, I mean, today, shadow economy in Russia, I mean, yeah. Shadow economy in the Soviet Union, it was a different, I mean, question. Yes, it is. Yeah, yeah, but it is. Yeah, we're still trying to find out. Okay, so, um, and let me also invite the panelists. If they have questions or comments of each other, please feel free to do so. Yes. generally how to acquire reliable information on Chechnya uh, from outside? Um, well, as far as I know, you have um, 
a few websites only of, of the diaspora. One is uh, Vina online. Um, but yeah, as, um, as the previous speaker said, um, it's these people are quite afraid to speak out because there have been instances when uh, uh, basically assassinations were attempted at them even when they were uh, abroad in France and, and Austria and so on. Um, but apart from uh, from the diaspora, um, I found youth to be most helpful in in, in my case in, in arranging interviews. Really, because um, I've I've met a few people through um, non-governmental organizations uh, in Grozny, and then they sort of um, helped me to expand my contacts there. Um, but institutionally, I I I, I can't really. Recommend you. I have a question for the whole panel, and it's a big, naive, and probably not answerable question. But um, it is: Why do you think Islam has proven to be so effective as a rallying cry in the region? I mean, I I, I know that this is not an answerable question, but you know, why Islam? Is it because it allows you to sort of? hook up with larger narratives that are outside your region and, you know, make your experience meaningful. Um, I was just wondering if anybody could reflect on that. Uh, 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 I'll try uh, to answer. Mm. Islam is, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, uh, Islam and the local people in terms of the Caucasus, they have seen uh, the uh, injustice of secular values. So they are double standards, and uh, and uh, that that is the inferiority complex where the which has been um, uh, promoted throughout the history after the Caucasus was incorporated into Russia. But so they, uh, the Islam is was you know, it, it was. Uh, is uh, as much as uh, intrinsic to the uh, local culture. Uh, it's uh, in, in the, uh, the, uh, the impact of Islam was uh, noticed uh, almost in all spheres of uh, social life, in, uh, you know, particularly in the uh, Eastern Caucasus, the Eastern Caucasus, in the West Caucasus, the, 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 the influence of Islam is lower. There is the ethnicity is very strong. Ethnic uh, identity, but in, uh, in our area, Islam is uh, is a priority, and we as uh, Muslims we identify that first of all with Islam format, then the next and next um, uh, levels of uh, identities are would be Russian or Ukrainian. I just thought that at one point you said that Islam is taking overtaking ethnic identity as primary. Yes, I just uh, I, I, uh, it is even in the uh, in the uh, in the Western in the Caucasus. It now is where the the this was very strong. Now is the Islam is uh, is taking over. But you also made a distinction between fundamentalism, Sufism, and more secular identity, yes. suggesting that there are there is differences within Islam. And implying that there's a sort of fair degree of mutability or changeability among them, that which can be affected by other factors. That's not monolithic. Yeah, I would like to uh, to clarify that uh, this is not. Uh, I mean, the, the distinct is on the, this. The distinctions. I mean, uh, the kind of uh, uh, just now uh, was um, <coughs> mentioned was promoted by Russian propaganda. Russian propaganda, uh, uh, it is oriental, it is a uh, usual oriental, uh, orientalist work to make divisions, artificial divisions. But in Islam, there is no problem uh, with whether it's Sufism or, or fundamentalism, it's, you know, it's um, spite of the system of Yeah, I agree. Um, I think there's basically uh, three main reasons uh, why uh, Islam is such a uh, such a strong rallying rallying force. One is, of course, uh, what has been already mentioned: uh, the, the appeal to honesty and, and purity, sort of against corruption, uh, but also against materialism, capitalism, and so on. 
Um, the second, I think, which is very important, especially in the case of Dagestan, but also North Caucasus uh, as a whole, is that it's, it's, a, it's an area of huge diversity. Um, ethnic, linguistic, and so on. So it's, a, it's really a unifying factor. Um, what else than, than Islam? Um, uh, well, of course, there was, there was communism before, but um, that didn't really resonate that well with the, um, it never really took, took uh, roots that strongly. And, and the third thing, what I, uh, what I think is very important is that uh, there, there are strong Sufi traditions, um, with, of course, um, Sufism being Islamic uh, mysticism, um, based on the individual relationship with God, but the, the practices, the religious practices, are very much collective. For instance, in Chechnya you have the practice of, of Zikr, which is uh, a religious ritual where, um, where, people, where people dance in circles. So it's very much uh, um, a community practice. Um, and I, I think, for, for instance, you can, you can trace this kind of transition um, from, from other identities uh, being more, more important in rallying people than, uh, and, and then Islam becoming, becoming more important. For instance, uh, the Chechens had this um, singer-songwriters in the end of 80s and the beginning of 90s, uh, Timur Mutsarayev and, and Imam Ali Sultanov, who basically started, uh, they have their roots in the 80s, uh, Russian uh, art counterculture, um, and then uh, the war comes and they start writing uh, songs, uh, uh, very nationalistic but also very, um, very Islamist songs. So, so they they sing, they write and sing in Russian, um, but they they talk about uh, uh, Shamil and, and so on, um, which which I think is it's an interesting transition also in, in popular culture. how much you guys have experience um, in outside of the provinces, outside of the periphery of the capitals, um, Moscow and St. Petersburg, but I was wondering if any of you could comment on if there are identity differences between people living in the Caucasus and Caucasian people living outside of the, of the area in Moscow and St. Petersburg. Do they see themselves as still very connected to their, their family members and their villages and cities in their homeland, or is it kind of a completely separate yet parallel kind of subculture? Or something different altogether? Yeah, I, I don't have much to say. Um, uh, the people I know who, uh, who are from North Caucasus originally and, and live or have lived in Moscow or, uh, or abroad, um, yeah, they, they mostly uh, keep uh, keep very close touch with their families. So the familiar tradition and also also the clan traditions, which is which is larger than the family, uh, um, is very important, of course. You know, the answer that there is no difference. Uh, there are Caucasians who are living outside and uh, they don't uh, cut their links with their Caucasus. And very, uh, there is a very strong uh, sense of solidarity, especially outside of Caucasus, the Caucasians. Um, um, dear colleagues, you described very, I would say, depressing, I mean, picture of the Caucasus and of Chechnya and of Afghanistan and so on and so forth. And I tell you that, you know, Caucasians are joyful people, I mean, yeah. And uh, uh, my impression is when somebody asks a question about uh, where, you know, Kavir is getting money, and you know, somebody explained that you know we completely depend on Putin. I tell you, number one, in the Caucasus, you know, people love to respect. I mean, a fatherly figure. And believe me, I know what I'm saying. Ramzan Kadir considers Putin as his fatherly figure. He's extremely loyal to him. And uh, number one, number two, in Chechnya, and you mentioned about it, it is Clannish society, which consists you know, of more than 100 different tapes. 
And you know, if your highest loyalty, I mean, in Chechnya, is you know your loyalty to a pay, I mean, first of all, and then I mean your loyalty to any other institution or to your nation or to your country, I mean, and so on and so forth. Now, can you imagine how it is difficult to find I mean, a common denominator? Somebody who would meet, I mean, requirements and appreciations, I mean, of all other tapes, of all other claims. So, thank God, I mean, you know, that we have, at least we have more or less, I mean, you know, peaceful situation under Kadir, I mean. Because Soviet, uh, the former Soviet Union is still, I mean, in the process of transition. Number two, do not forget that when, um, um, you know, uh, Yeltsin, Svetlana uh, Pamidi, uh, uh, you know, he initiated this policy of uh, privatization, in my view, privatization was the greatest robbery in mankind's history. And, you know, uh, uh, of course, uh, 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 organized criminal groups played an extremely important role I mean, in this privatization. And what is called Russian Mafia is not really Russian Mafia, you know. One of the strongest I mean, units in this Russian Mafia was the Caucasian Mafia, including, you know, Chechen Mafia. And now, I mean, you know, of course, they became all civilized, and they are very successful, you know, businessmen in Russia. They make money in Russia. And then money is transferred to Chechnya or to Dagestan or to Georgia or to Armenia. Everybody's happy. And you still can find, I mean, even some Russians in the middle, I mean, you know, after all these, I mean, you know, transitions. So you already asked the question to the <laughs> reproduction of the conditions in Chechnya. And then you, you had a combination of the local Pakistani government, the Russian military authorities, and a much less receptive society, social structure in Pakistan that allowed for this relatively rapid defeat of this Chechen guerrilla invasion in August, September of 1999. So I guess my question is listening to the presentation uh, is to what extent has that fundamentally changed since 1999? Is, this, is the overall context that different, that much more threatening? And, and, and you implied it was the Russian state that was the main source of threat in transforming the situation. Oh, uh, yeah, on this point, Mark. You left that one more factor, Go ahead. which is Berezovsky being there and given by Saya the suitcase full of money. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay, good point. So, please, if you wish. Is the the social political context more favorable to that kind of oppression today? It sounds like it is, but I'm asking you that question than it was in 1990. Uh, you know, I can say this, uh, the, the Pakistanis maybe, uh, they, as you mentioned, they uh, contributed to the defeat, uh, defeat uh, in, uh, of this uh, current uh, uh, groups of Chechens and Pakistanis as well, you know, among them. Uh, 
the peoples of Dagestan since then they have changed their attitudes towards the Russian independent assembly because after um, the, throughout these 15 or 20, uh, 15 years, uh, the, because of the nationalism in Moscow and in, uh, in different parts of uh, Russia, uh, the Dagestans are not that patriotic as uh, as were in the they have changed their efforts. Sure. Um, I think basically he tries to um, to combine these different elements into a single identity that he and his government promotes, uh, amongst others also through um, the reconstruction program and through, through urbanization, through city planning. Um, and this basically consists of, of watering down this um, this identity, so trying to promote a, a, a moderate um, Chechen nationalism, a non-confrontational form of nationalism, and uh, a moderate so-called traditional Islam, or Islam with Chechen characteristics. Um, I, I think sometimes um, these two are, are incompatible, and, and they're sort of mixtures of yeah, the mixture seems quite, quite unnatural. Um, and yeah, if you, if you walk around Grozny, you actually see how um, how these things clash. You know, um, it's, it's maybe more obvious than, than it was from the pictures because you, you have these separate places. Um, but, but when you have you have a mosque in a few a few hundred meters away, you have basically solid style apartment buildings, and then um, maybe two, two or three blocks away, you have a modern shopping center, and uh, a few blocks away, you have a you have a big stadium, and you have a, um, I don't know a really old style marketplace uh, with all the used uh, used cars and everything. So it's um, it's sort of, sort of very diverse, and, and this image that they're trying to promote of, of this Chechen modernism, at least uh, um, in architecture and urbanism, try to sort of um, hides a lot of uh, heterogeneity um, in, in how the city looks and feels. <laughs> 